the Barracuda 57 here. For this video I'll be talking about future projections, I'll be talking about following your dreams, following your passions, and doing what you feel is right to you. It's basically just about, you know, following your dream, and it's also basically about um, how you create your own reality, and you choose what happens, and where you go with your life, and this, this also goes on to the topic of your perspective, focus, um, it goes on to travel, work, the future, and just generally kind of like following your gut, following your intuition and your animal instincts basically, and learning how to kind of like be true to yourself and follow what you want to follow without kind of like other people's and society's intervening, is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, I'll be as brief as possible. It might go on for a long time because most of my videos go over 20 minutes, but you know, I'll keep it as short as subtle as I can. Thank you for watching. Now, I'm rereading a book, and it's a very amazing book, and it's quite a well-known book. And if you're an NF, or you know, an empath, an old soul, an intuitive, you know, or if you're someone who likes the bigger picture, likes to travel, likes thinking about their dreams, desires, their goals, their ambitions, and following their instinct and their gut, they will absolutely love this book. It's a book called The Alchemist by Paul Cahello, and it's my second time reading it, and I just absolutely love it. I read it two years ago before finding uh, Myers-Briggs, MBTI, uh, INFJ, personality types, and rereading it again, I'm just having so many perspectives. Now I, collect, I connect a lot with Paul Cahello, and his book is just amazing. And it, I mean, I, here's the book here, The Alchemist. And seriously, like, this is such a recommended read. If you haven't read it, oh, it is such a good book, because it just refreshes you, it, like, re revitalizes you, makes you feel young, makes you feel passionate again, and it just, you know, it kind of lights the spark if you've lost your inspiration. It's a book about following your dream, and a lot of the symbolisms, the connectivity, the language, the kind of verse, the writing is very much how intuitives think, or, you know, Apart from that, just basically talking about the heart and about your inner child. This could be for anyone. Now, lots of people come to me and they're all, you know, they, you see a lot of videos and a lot of posts where people are like, oh, I'm stuck, I'm depressed, uh, you know, life is really difficult, uh, people are really difficult, I hate conflict, um, I'm stuck in a job which I don't like, and all these things, you know, negative, negative, ne negative, the kind of the world's against me mentality, or society's against me, or kind of like, there are so many walls in life and I can't get past them. Naturally, it's all perception. It really is. It's all perspective. It's all focus. The thing is, guys, um, what you focus on in life is what you get. You can say this for anyone. Let's say, for example, you had a scenario where there was a man sneaking up on another man. Now, a positive person would think, oh, this scenario is weird, but, you know, probably he's just their friends and that guy sneaking up on him to kind of, like, scare him and, you know, joke with him and kind of, like, touch him on the shoulder and freak him out a bit as a joke. A negative person, being a negative person, will have their focus and, and see what they want to see. Positive, positive people see what they want to see, negative people see what they want to see, realistic people see what they want to see. So in comparison to that, a negative person will be like, oh god, that guy's going to rub him, look, he's really shifty and he's like being really slow and his body language is really sneaky and sly. It's negative, therefore they're going to assume a negative scenario. Now you can compare this to real life and you can say that, oh, you know, life is difficult and everything is really hard and I can't do anything. If you have that mentality, that's what you're going to have. If you only focus on the negatives, you'll only see the negatives. What you see is what you get. If you see the positives in everything, you'll see that every cloud is a silver lining. And it sounds wishy-washy, but I mean, you, it's good to be realistic, but you have to see the positives, because if you only see the negatives, negatives will come to you. It's yin and yang, and it's very much, you know, karma. If you believe that or not, it's up to you. But I mean, if you don't believe that, it's just think about it. You know, if you always see the negatives, you always see the flaws and everything, you can't appreciate anything because everything's bad, everything's negative, and everything has a problem with it, and everything has a flaw. But if you see the good in it, you think, oh, you know, 
this is really bad, this situation is crap, but at least, you know, I have a roof over my head, at least I have food, at least I have water, at least I have shelter, a place to sleep, people to talk to, online or offline, Te I have technology, I have, pr I have things which I own, I have, you know, all these things. So many people out there have it so much worse than you, so just don't complain and don't make excuses. This is what I mean, if you only see the negatives, even though you've got a lot of things which a lot of people don't have, because you see the negative in everything, you know, it's just, it's all perspective. What might be junk to you could be a treasure to someone else. You know, it's perspective again. So, you know, so, I mean, like, connected to The Alchemist, which is the, one of the main focuses of what I'm trying to talk about, is... You create your reality. Now let's say for example, you were stuck, you were doing something you didn't like to do and you were fed up and you weren't following your dreams, your passions and you're doing a job which let's say was working in an office for example, but when you were younger you wanted to become a footballer and all you thought about was becoming a footballer and you collected football cards, you watched TV and you played football and you wanted to be a star but you know then you found out that maybe money, you didn't have a lot of money you found out that you were good at other things like mathematics, yet you, you didn't naturally like it, but you were just talented at, any, at it anyway. That's the thing, some people are really talented at things, but if they don't have a passion for it, it's a waste of a talent. Now, you could be really logical, you could be really mathematical, you could be really musically talented, but if you don't like any of these things and you're not passionate about them, then, you know, it's just an extra asset or an extra trait that you have that you can do, but you just don't really like feel for it basically so I mean like think about it like this yes you might be stuck in an office you might be stuck in a dead-end place you know it, it, it's not necessarily the truth you don't have to be stuck there forever it's your choice to leave it's your choice to do what you want to do now the thing is connected to the footballer idea to connect it to following your dreams you know if you're always thinking about football in every conversation you have again linking to the start what you see is what you get so someone could be having a topic about something, let's say about material, and then somehow you jump in and you start talking about materials, and then it makes you think of patterns, then it makes you think of colours, then it makes you think of black and white, then black and white maybe make you think of a football, and then the football might make you think of, you know, the sport. You know, all these things. Because you're so orientated into that one image, because you're so passionate about that one thing, and because all you see is football, 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 football everywhere, It'll come into your life unconsciously, and you'll seek out ways to get what you want. Now, you could work really hard and train, you can talk to people. I mean, because football's on, on your mind, people see you as a person who is a football person, because you love it, and it's like everything you love, everything you dream, everything you strive for. And because you become the thing that you love so much, it kind of attracts things towards you. Now this is called the law of attraction, if you've never heard of it. And it's basically, you know, what you love, what you seek out, and what you look for and focus at, is what the universe will give back to you. Now yes, in a logical standpoint it sounds wishy-washy, but it makes sense in a logical way. I mean, yes, what I've just said is illogical and kind of abstract. But it doesn't have to be. Again, that's perspective. Something that's abstract doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that, oh, from a logical standpoint, it's, it's weird and different. But that's not to say it's wrong. Again, it's focus. Again, it's perspective. That's just a negative view on something which could be positive. You know, again. So linking back to The Alchemist. Now, basically, everything that I've said connects to this book right here. Now, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but it is seriously such a good book in so many ways that I can't even explain. And it's been a bestseller. It's sold 65 million copies worldwide, been translated, and all these things. It's a, it's a fable about following your dream, basically. And it literally says right there, a fable about following your dream. And it's about a boy who grew up in a Spanish province. He was poor. He was a farmer. But he had this dream that he would go to the pyramids to find this object, to find something which, you know, meant a lot to him. And yes, he was poor. He loved traveling. But he, he was so passionate about his dreams. He, he got offered the choice to become a priest. He never wanted to do that because he wanted to travel. He wanted to see the world. He wanted to do all these things. And in the end, he travels, goes to all these places. And even though he's poor, he works hard. But yet he still has the focus of his dream in his head. 
and he he thinks about it every day and he feels that one day I'll get there and uh, nothing's going to stop me. I might be poor, I might be a shepherd and there might be many continents, many countries, many mountains to get to my dream but I'm going to get there. And in the end he does get to his dream. Why? Why is this? Because he doesn't let distractions stop him. He doesn't let obstacles come in his way. He could have been a baker, he could have been a priest, he could have fallen in love and then fall, fallen off track. But I mean, even if he was all these things, even if he became a baker and he worked hard, even if he, as long as he still had that dream in his mind, he could work as a baker, collect money, and then go to that place he wanted to go to. If he fell in love with a girl, I mean, fair enough. But if you two were both in love enough, she wouldn't mind what you were doing and she'd be happy that you were passionate and that you were adventurous. I mean, love doesn't have to stop your dream. I mean, if anything, love should support your dream. And I mean, he could have fallen in love, got a girlfriend, got married, but that doesn't mean he had to have stopped. He doesn't do that in the book. He doesn't become a baker. He doesn't fall in love and get married. But basically, he meets people along the way. He goes to places. He finds connections, finds symbolisms, finds good omens, finds, you know, lots of things which mean a lot to him on his travel. And it's basically about the journey of life metaphorically and physically towards what you want to get towards your focus now I know it's so easy to say that and I know many of you might not know what your dream is or what your goal is or you know but you know once you know what it is it'll click and it's like instantaneous and you'll feel it like this is what I want to do this is what I have to do until you kind of find that passion you know you're just gonna have to keep searching which is good because I mean it could be anything now, you know, literally, like true love, once you know what it is, it's instantaneous. It hits you, and you're like, this is it. This is the real thing. Like, it feels real. I, I feel like I'm meant to do this. I, it feels illogical, and it feels like I could do anything else, but it feels I have to do this. That is what it is, in a nutshell. Now, connected to this, Paul Cahello, Ke Paul Cahello, talks about the many things which people do and why they never obtain their dream, why they end up just following else what society does and never kind of being individuals and doing what they feel they should be doing. Now, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'll read you the quick passage and then I'll also talk to you a little bit about something further on, which is connected to this. But It's basically three pages and I'll read it as swiftly and as well as I can. This is by the author himself before the actual book starts. So that is, this is the prologue. Yeah, that's the prologue. So this is three pages basically about life and about why people struggle in following their dreams and doing what they feel they need to do. What is a personal calling? It's God's blessing. It's a path that God chose for you here on earth. Whenever we do something that fills us in, in, with enthusiasm, we are following a legend. However, why don't we all have the courage to follow our dream? Why? There are four obstacles. First, we're told from childhood and onwards that what we want to do is impossible. We grow up with the idea that as the years accumulate, the layers of prejudice, fear and guilt comes into contact with us, and our personal calling becomes deeply buried in our soul, almost to become invisible, but it's still there. If we have the courage to follow our dream, we are then faced with the second obstacle, love. We know that what we want to do is what we want to do, but we're afraid of hurting those around us by abandoning everything in order to pursue our dreams. We do not realize that love is just a further impetus, not something that will prevent us from going forward, that, but those who generally love us will wish us well and want us to be happy and are prepared to help us for our journey. It's not an obstacle. It should be encouragement. Once, we, once we've accepted that love is a stimulus, we come up against the third obstacle, fear of defeat. We want to fight for our dream, and we would rather suffer far more for the rest of our lives to try and find out what our dream is, but because we cannot fall back on the old excuse, oh well, I didn't want it anyway. We do want it, and the thing is, we've staked everything for it, and the path of our personal calling is no easy path, except that our whole heart is on this journey. 
When we are warriors of light, we must be prepared to have patience in difficult times and to know that the universe is conspiring for our favor, even though we might not feel it. I ask myself, are defeats necessary? Well, necessary or not, they happen. And when they first happen for fighting our dream, we have no experience of any mistakes. The secret, the secret of life, though, is to fall seven times and get up eight times, and to never stop and to never give up. So why is it important to live our personal calling if we're only going to suffer more than other people? Because once we've overcome our defeats, and we always do, we are filled with a greater sense of euphoria and confidence that nothing can stop us. In the silence of our hearts we know that we are proving to ourselves that we are worthy of the miracle of life and we are worthy enough to follow what we feel is right. Each day, each hour is part of the good fight, even now as you're reading this. With enthusiasm and pleasure, intensity, unexpected suffering passes more quickly than suffering and doing nothing about it. The latter always goes on for years and without noticing eats away at our soul until we found out that we've not even started to follow our dream. And in the end we're left with bitterness and it stays with us for the rest of our lives. Having discerned our dreams, having used the power of love to nurture it, and spent many years with scars following it, we suddenly noticed that it was what we always wanted is there. It is actually waiting for us. Perhaps the very next day. Then comes the fourth obstacle, the fear of realizing the dream for which we've been fighting for all our lives. Oscar Wilde said, each man kills the very thing he loves, and it's true. The mere possibility of getting what you want fills, fills the soul of an ordinary person with guilt. We look around of those who had failed and those who have tried to get what they want but not got it and we feel what they feel and we feel that we do not deserve to get what we want either. We forget about all the obstacles we overcome. Every day we're overcoming obstacles but we don't think about them. All the suffering we've endured to get where we are now, all the things we've had to give up in order to get what we want. I've known a lot of people who, from their personal calling, is within their grasp and went on to commit a series of stupid mistakes and never ended up reaching their goal when it was only a step away. This is the most dangerous of obstacles because it's a kind of saintly aura about it, renouncing joy and conquest. But if you believe yourself worthy of the thing you fought for so hard, then you become an instrument of God and you help the soul of the world and you understand why you're here. And that's the words of Paul Cathella, or Cahella. And it's brilliant. I mean, it really is. I mean, connected that to that, he also, within the story itself, there's a quote, uh, there's a quote at the beginning of the book which talks, which a, a wise king. man talks to a boy. Now this, my, this wise man is the wisest man ever. And he's so well known throughout the world and he's known to be the wisest person ever. And it's a small story within the book, and it's about a boy who goes to see the wise man to learn about how to be wise and to follow his dreams. And the wise man is busy, and he's got a whole crowd of people wanting to see him. And the wise man says to this boy, come back to me in two hours, but hold this, it's a spoon and it's full of oil. I want you to walk around the entire palace which I own and not spill the oil. The boy does it, he walks around the palace. He comes back in two hours, talks to the man. The man says, did you notice any of the paintings that were around the palace? The boy says, no, I didn't think about that at all. I was too busy concentrating on the spoon. The man says, if you're always focusing on one thing, if you're always focusing on your dream, you'll never be aware of the things around you and you won't be able to take in and absorb the environment. He said, go back and do this again. He did it again. This time the boy looked at all the history, at all the paintings, you know, absorbed it, absorbed the culture, learnt about things along his travels. He came back in two hours, spoke to the man again. The man said, look, your spoon is empty. You are focusing too much on the environment and everything around you to follow your dream and to follow your focus. And then the boy said, what can I do to balance it? And the man said to him, Focus on the things around you, your friends, your people, where you're going, what you're doing, you know, your job. 
but always have the dream in mind always even though you're walking around focusing on the things around you always focus on the spoon with the oil always focus on your dream if you never lose focus of your dream even though you're out doing lots of things which might not be helping you towards your dream because you've got it in your mind that whatever happens I'll end up doing this you'll end up doing it and in doing so you can look around the palace you can look around and look at all the paintings and still focus on the spoon that you're holding and you can still focus on your dreams it's learning to balance the two you can't have too much of one you can't have too much of the other yin and yang you need to balance the two and that's the key to success that's the key to happiness now I can't explain it much more than that because I know that this video will go on very far if I keep doing it but basically everything you need to know about what I'm saying and what I've said is in this book now it sounds like I'm advertising yes and it sounds like I'm a market person but you know if it helps it helps you can read it online you can read it paperback whatever you want but as long as you, you know you, you have some insight into it that's all you need so basically from those two you've got the law of attraction what you see is what you get and the universe gives you what you seek to look for as a focus so obviously negative people will always see the negative things positive people will always see the positive things and people who balance it can obviously like see both sides to it kind of thing um, connected to this is kind of like obviously if you have depression it's easier said than done but if you change your focus there's no such thing as a wall there's no such thing as separation everything's connected but I mean obviously you know it, it takes a while to kind of get into that mindset and to realize that and also if you have depression you think that there's lots of obstacles and lots of walls to get what you want or to do something simply but at the end of the day a wall is just a wall because you've made it I mean you can create a door you can create a ladder and you can create openings around the wall a wall's only there temporarily I mean nothing lasts forever so don't believe that a wall's going to be there forever because it won't be even in a realistic sense of things this house won't be here forever you know and um yeah basically my next point is you know we create the world around us now there have been many articles connected to this that we create our own reality there's been articles that the world is a hologram a projection and the world responds to us now obviously a logical person will be like whoa what have you just said but have a read, have a look on the internet, I'm not going to explain it much more than that, but that's a concept and an idea. I'm not saying that you should agree with me or disagree with me, just I'm throwing that out there, basically. And connected to that, and what I'm trying to say, related to this whole topic of you create your reality, you decide what happens with your life, you follow your passions, you follow your dreams, is, you know, this sense of you create your reality. Now connected to this is an experiment done by a Japanese doctor called Dr. Emoto and he did a famous experiment called the rice experiment. Now this experiment showed that if you put a focus and an energy and a kind of like label onto something it becomes that thing. You can say this with children if you treat a child well it will be really kind of like happy and positive and kind of more good if you treat a child badly it would be very spiteful, hateful, angry if you ignore a child you know it'll feel bad, it'll feel alone, it'll feel you know, it'll feel, you know, it'll ju it's just negative Dr. Emoto has conducted another interesting experiment he placed rice into three glass beakers and covered it with water and then every day for a month he said thank you to one beaker you're an idiot to the second and the third one he completely ignored after one month the rice that had been thanked began to ferment giving off a strong pleasant aroma the rice in the second beaker turned black and the rice that was ignored began to rot Dr. Emoto thinks that this experiment provides an important lesson especially with regard to how we treat children 
We should take care of them, give them attention, and converse with them. Indifference does the greatest harm. Tell some dreamy story, but almost. For the experiment, I used three tablespoons of rice. Um, you could either use cooked rice, or you could just literally not cook any rice and put it straight into water. Um, as long as you have water in the actual jars, it doesn't matter whether you've cooked the rice or not. Um, but what I did was, I cooked it, and I used three tablespoons, put them into the jars, made sure it was equal, and then added a little bit of water, so um, just about a pinch, maybe about that much, in each jar, just to kind of give it kind of e equal weighting. And I made sure all the levels were the same, and I made sure all the water levels were the same, so nothing was different, and it was all equal and fair. And here is the experiment in action. This is day one. And as you can see, all the jars are fine. All the jars are equal amounts. And I don't know if you could see it, but each jar has water about up to here. But I don't think you could see it in the camera. Um, basically, yeah, that's it. That's as simple as it is. As long as you label each jar, um, that's all you need, really. And part of the experiment, what you have to do is every day you have to go to each jar and you have to kind of um, you have to kind of say what each jar represents and what it embodies. It's a kind of like blessing. It's a kind of like um, labeling, if you will, of the jars. <clears throat> I don't know if the experiment actually works without you doing this. You could try it, but. The experiment um, asks you to do this for it to work, so I'm not sure if the labels themselves actually are enough and you have to do this part, but anyway, that's up to you to decide. Um, Alright, so what I've done is I've labelled each of them positives and negatives, so I've got sadness, happiness, anger, laughter, hate, and love. I've got another jar, which is down there. Um, which is separate to that, which I've used my name in it. So obviously you've got emotions and feelings, and then down there I've got a separate one which I'll do um, <coughs> on my own, uh, which will represent myself. And it's just um, a kind of detached experiment, but it's still something I wanted to like try out, kind of thing. <coughs> anyway, it's as simple as this. Every morning or every afternoon or at least once a day until you get the results you go up to the jars and say this jar is sad this jar represents you know sadness embody sadness and it is sad and so on and then you just do it for every single one say like this one represents happiness it's happy this one's angry it represents anger it has rage all these things and saying I'm angry with this jar, I'm happy with this jar, I'm sad with this jar, you know, all those things. Put focus and energy into each jar, and that jar will become those things. Now, like I said in the earlier part of these videos, you create your own reality, and if you label something and give it a kind of meaning and a purpose, it kind of becomes those things interestingly or not. So I'm going to keep on doing these every day and record the results every day. And I think the results are supposed to, it's supposed to give results after about two weeks. Um, so I'm just going to keep going and hopefully, you know, soon I'll get some results from each of them. And it'll be interesting to see what the outcome is. This is day seven. Um, anger. Let's see, uh, there's a yellow patch there, which is mold. There's two brown patches there, which are different molds. There's a bit of yellow coming there, so that's getting much worse. That's anger. Love. It seems to be all right. That is just uh, what's it called? Water particle. And yeah, that seems all right. Happiness. 
seems unchanged. Uh, a few bits of the rice is going a little bit yellowy, but there's no mould in that one. Sadness seems to be exactly the same. Uh, the rice on the top seems to be wetter than all the other rices. I don't know why. That just might be me overthinking. But I think that rice, even though it has the same amount of water in each one, that one seems to be a bit more wet at the top. But that might just be me overthinking. Hate doesn't seem to have changed that much from yesterday, apart from that grey spot is a bit bigger than it was before. If you can see, it's right there. And that's it. That doesn't seem to that doesn't seem to be getting worse. And laughter has a brown spot and a black spot. Um, so yeah. And this is day seven. I'm considering skipping a few days and maybe like skipping to day fifteen or something, or maybe today. Um, what's it called? Day nine, because you know this might take longer than I anticipated. Right, this is day 13. Yes, unlucky 13. Um, sadness is alright. Uh, it's going a bit grey slightly, but apart from that, nothing has changed that much. With anger, um, that yellow patch is much stronger now. I don't know if you, I can change it. But yeah, there's a yellow patch right there, which is just horrid. And you've got a black, two black bits, and they're getting much worse. They look like, you know, looks like chocolate in there, which is not nice. That's anger. That is much worse than before. You've got laughter, which is getting worse, but it's not as bad as anger. But, yeah, you've got a big spot there, and you've got a grey spot further back there. Yeah. So those two are not good. Hate is getting a few more black spots. As you can see, there is one right there, and you've got another there, but it's a bit hidden, so you can't really see it that well. Happiness, uh, completely unchanged, and love, also pretty much unchanged. So yeah, this is day 13, and yeah going well. I hope I don't have to wait a month to get like the full results because that's just going to be annoying to wait. Alright, this is day 19. Alright, you've got all the three bads there, all the three goods there. Alright, so sadness is unchanged still. We've got a little bit of grey there in the middle, uh, there, but it's pretty much the same. Um, anger three two very two there's two very defined spots there they've got much much worse than before and we've got another third spot growing oh and there's a yellow patch there which is getting worse as well hate has got a spot there in the middle and it has also got another there um, so yeah those are still the same love pretty much the same and untouched Laughter, apart from that one big one there. Um, oh, and there's getting another there. That's it, really. That's just a water droplet. That is dirt, and that is mold as well. So, laughter is, yeah, it's the same, and happiness is the same. And that is day 19. This is day 31, so it's been about a month since I've started. And I'm still deciding whether to do another month or to stop it here, but we'll see. Um, so happiness is completely fine. Um, anger, after the, a month, has mould growing in it and it's got more on the way. Laughter has a little bit of mould in it and it's gone really watery. And yeah, it looks disgusting. Not as much mould as anger, but that's got a little bit in, and also it's going really watery for some reason. Love is completely fine. Sadness, uh, just really watery again, but that's fine as well. And hate has lots of black bits on the inside, as you can see. So yeah, that has been a month, and those are the results.
and finally this is day 40. I'm not going to do any more days because I'm going back to university soon uh, so but I mean 40 days has been plenty so this is laughter as you can see that's got mold in it uh, it's really watery it's got another bit of mold there um, it's just become flattened and all the rice has fallen down into the mold so that is that's turned out bad in the end love is pretty much the same it was as the beginning like you know no change there no mold and it's all exactly the same so that's good that's not changed hate has got lots of bits of mold I don't know if you can see there there's a black bit right in the center another black bit there um, it's just oh, it's just basically this is just getting worse the, the rice is going gray I don't know if you can see it in this light but that rice is not good basically and if you compare the two I mean it's not really that good that one so that's definitely got worse um, happiness pretty much the same as love it's been exactly the same and there is no mold in there whatsoever which is pretty amazing so that's happiness anger as you can see that is just getting horribly bad that's black there black there you've got like yellow patches there Oh, that's horrible. That's anger. And sadness, uh, basically that's just all water. All watery at the bottom. And the rice is going really mushy and wet at the top. So that's looking weird. But, I mean, there's no mould in that one. Maybe a tiny little bit, but I can't hardly see any. So that's just, you know, become really watery. So that's sadness. Um, so yeah, that's it guys. Um, I'm not going to do any more because it's obviously taken a lot of time as, through the experiment. But I mean, have a look on the internet about this experiment and why not try it yourselves and see what your results come out with. But yeah, that's the result and that was the experiment. And I'd say it's successful given the amount of change and seeing as we've done exactly the same thing for every jar there are completely different like results for each jar all because we've labeled something and all because we've put an energy and a focus towards something you know something to think about anyway now after seeing this I'm not telling you what to do you can decide what you want and you can decide how to feel after this it's up to you what you decide but obviously um you know these are just insights and ideas and kind of different focuses so again, you know, if you're stuck, all you have to do is change your focus. This could be for anything. If you have a wall, whether it be a very large wall, a small wall, or, you know, an actual wall, like a physical real wall, there's a way around it all the time. There's no such thing as a wall. So, you know, I have not much to say after that because I've said everything I need to say. But all, I, all I'm going to say is, guys, you know, you create your own reality. And I've said that many times. So, you know, if you want something so bad and you believe you'll, you'll get it, you'll get it. Don't say, I might get it, because the chances are if you say, I might, that's already kind of like the self-confidence in here is, is bad. But if you say, I will get it, instead of, I might get it, that means whatever happens, I'm going to fight for it. You know, whatever happens, I'll get it. You know, just believe in yourself and believe you can do it and you will. Easy. And connected to that, you know, read The Alchemist by Paul, by Paul Kello, because it's a great read, and it just helps back up what I've been saying, and, you know, just basically the mechanics of everything I've been trying to tell you in this whole video. As well as this, there's many articles on the internet about, you know, following your heart, following your passions, believing in yourself, creating your own reality, the law of attraction, and so on. Anyway. That's enough for me today. Thank you guys for watching. This is the Be In The Barracuda 57. Over and out.